Since an hour ago, I am still Fiji. <laughs> and I am really excited to introduce our next speaker, Avni Shah. Avni joined Google in 2003, and she's now a VP of product management, heading up a new initiative focused on long-term impact in education. Previously, she led the product team for the Chrome browser, growing it to over a billion users. She also spent two years in Switzerland leading Google Maps and local efforts for Europe's Middle East and Africa. And then in her early years, she kicked off Google's first search personalization efforts. It must have taken a lot of guts for Avni to accomplish all of these things. So she's here today to talk to us about confronting fear. Please join me in welcoming Avni. Yeah, good, all right. Thanks, Fiji. So a few years ago, I gave a talk about embracing the uncomfortable, about times that I pushed myself to do things that were really scary, and how those were times where I felt like I learned and had step function growth in my career. And as part of that, I talked about fear and about how fear can hold you back. A question I've gotten a lot since then is, well, are there times when you did let fear get in the way? And that got me thinking. It got me thinking about the different kinds of fear I faced in my career, the way they've threatened to hold me back or even been successful in doing so, and ultimately about the strategies that I've used to work through them and confront them. So that's what I thought I would share with you all today. The first fear I had to face was the fear of rejection, of asking for something and being told no. And I actually blame my parents for this one because I wasn't allowed to date growing up. And so I didn't get to like ask a whole bunch of people out and get rejected and get the whole thing out of my system. So by the time I got to the professional world, this fear was new to me. And in truth, it actually took a while for this fear to reach me, not because I wasn't afraid to ask for things, but because I didn't actually know that asking for things was something you could do. I remember being four years into my career at Google working on personalized search when my manager decided to leave the company. And it wasn't clear what was gonna to happen to the team or who was gonna take over. And even though I, was, I had been there the longest, I was the most senior PM on the team, it didn't even occur to me to ask for this role. It's like my subconscious had talked me out of it before the thought could even make itself known. And it wasn't until a little while later someone else asked for the role and was given it that it occurred to me that I could have done the same thing and that maybe it was a missed opportunity. So at that point, I got the memo. Ask for what you want. But that didn't actually make the act of asking any easier. At Google, we have this process where you nominate yourself for promotion. And I remember one cycle, I was psyching myself up to talk to my manager about it. And I felt you know, really nervous because it was the first time I was having this kind of conversation. And prepared, of course, because I had practiced in front of a mirror many times. And when he told me he didn't think I was quite ready, I was visibly crushed. Like so much so, he actually called me over the weekend just to make sure I was okay. And it wasn't just the no that sucked. I mean, yes, that wasn't great, but it was like that no had reaffirmed all this internal doubt and insecurity that I had been holding on to. And it took a little bit of time and distance, but what I realized was two things. One, I didn't lose anything by asking because the outcome would have been the same anyway. And that by asking, I'd actually learned something. My manager gave me really good feedback on the, on the gap and where he thought I should, should put in some work, and so I could put my growth mindset hat on and move forward. And the more I asked for things, the easier it got, even when the answer was no. Several years later in my career, I was working on a team, and there was this planned reorg across the entire organization. And before the decisions were final, I wrote up a pitch of you know, the team I wanted to lead and why I thought I was a you know, great position to do it. And, I knew it was a bit of a long shot, and it didn't end up working out. But the interesting thing was, throughout that whole time, it never occurred to me not to ask. Of course I was gonna ask for it. And of course I was gonna be okay, no matter what the answer was. And so, 
Over time, I've learned two things about the fear of rejection. One, when I do get told no, the stories that I tell myself, the self-talk that I engage in is actually really critical. And it's critical really any time I fail at something or I don't live up to my own standards or things don't go quite the way I planned. If I have any amount of insecurity, it's really easy for that self-talk to kind of dig in and make it worse and kind of grow it. But if I'm able to put that aside, even just for a moment, I can then focus on what I need to learn from that incident and how I can be better prepared next time. And I found that this positive self-talk not only makes each individual instance of rejection better, but because I've cemented this more positive memory in my mind, I'm actually able and more willing to take on the next instance. The second thing I've learned about the fear of rejection is that it's one you can overcome. It's, it gets easier with practice. It's kind of like building a muscle, and a really important one, because if I don't have the, the courage to ask for what I want, and advocate for myself, then I'm likely to miss out on some pretty big opportunities going forward. So I started asking for more things and adding a few yeses to my pile of no's. And as I did that, I took on bigger roles with more responsibility, where I came face to face with the second fear that has threatened to hold me back, the fear of being underqualified or being exposed as such. And one of the ways that this fear manifests itself is a reluctance to take on risk and new opportunity. The most salient encounter I've had with this fear came about six years into my time at Google, in the summer of 2009. I was trying to decide whether to uproot my life and move to another country for a few years. It was a pretty unique opportunity. I could move to Zurich, Switzerland, work on a new team and a product I loved, Google Maps, and um, and I could be a manager for the first time. It sounded amazing and terrifying. In addition to that, I had just gotten married, so I was gonna be living with somebody for the first time in a new country with no friends or family, with a job I felt really underqualified for. And I remember being on the last leg of our honeymoon, just thinking to myself, I can't do it. Like, I just, I'm not ready. I, I've been fooling people for the past six years, and if I take this job, they're gonna find me out. And I, you know, after some time and with the help of a supportive new husband, I realized a few things. First, if I had been fooling people, apparently I was doing a pretty good job. So <laughs> maybe I could keep it up for a few more years at least. Um, but more importantly, that imposter syndrome, which we talk about now, it's felt by men and women alike, people at all levels, and that I wasn't alone. Second, I had people that believed in me. My husband believed in me, my new manager, my former manager, they all thought I could do it. So if they thought I could do it, maybe I should too. And third, this was the career path that at least I thought I wanted. And so I might as well try it. And if I fail, I fail. But at least I will have learned something in the process. So I went. And in those two years, I learned more than I could have even expected, both professionally and personally. I learned that I like managing people and that I was pretty decent at it. I learned how to come on to a new team and build credibility all over again. I learned about myself that the first six months of a transition are really tough. I feel miserable and incompetent and then suddenly it gets better. I learned about building products for a totally new market with users that have very different user expectations and and perspectives and how to take that into account. I even learned how to be a better coworker, being on the other end of a nine hour time difference. My husband and I traveled the world, we got introduced to new cuisines, new cultures, new countries. It was hands down an amazing time. And I almost didn't do it. And what I've learned about this fear of feeling underqualified, about imposter syndrome, is that it doesn't actually get easier with time. It doesn't go away with practice. But it is one that I've learned to recognize and to come to terms with. And in particular, when I'm faced with an opportunity that seems really scary, that fear and that discomfort is actually a good thing. And that fear should go in the pros column, not the cons column, because it's likely an indicator of a really steep learning curve up ahead. The third fear I wanted to talk about today is one that 
I've actually only encountered pretty recently. It's the fear of moving backwards, of becoming invisible, of losing momentum. I came face to face with this fear in 2015 when I was getting ready to go on maternity leave with my second baby. At the time, I was leading product for Chrome browser and things were actually going really well. We had just surpassed a billion users. We had this really exciting roadmap. I loved the team I was working with. I felt lucky to be working on something so core to Google strategy. And I'd even started to get an external presence, like being on stage at Google I.O., our annual conference. But in spite of all of that, it didn't quite feel right. In the back of my mind, I had felt for a long time that I wanted to work on improving education. From a young age, my dad had instilled in me how important getting a good education was. In fact, one of his favorite things to say was, the most important word in the English language begins with an E and ends with an N and has nine letters. And growing up, I got to see that he was right. We spent many summers in India where I could see the difference firsthand that a good education could make to not just to individuals, but also communities as a whole. And I always felt really lucky that my parents had put such an emphasis on my sister and I getting a good education. In high school, my dad drove an hour and a half to and from work every day just so we could live in a good school district in Alabama. And my parents worked and saved for years so that we could both go to college. So by the time 2015 rolled around, I had known that at some point, I wanted to help everyone get an opportunity for the kind of education that I had been given. I remember being on maternity leave, probably in some sleep-deprived, hallucinogenic state, thinking, well, what am I waiting for? Why not now? Of course, I knew nothing about education other than having been lucky enough to get one, so I spent months talking to people reading, trying to understand the problems in the space and where I felt I could contribute. I ended up realizing that Google was a really interesting place to work on this problem for all kinds of reasons. So I wrote up a pitch for a new project I wanted to start, took it to Sundar, and amazingly he said yes. Now what's interesting about this is that if I had never worked through my first two fears, the fear of rejection, I had to actually ask for this thing, and the fear of feeling underqualified, I was entering a domain I knew nothing about then I would have never gotten to this point. And I would have never had the opportunity to work on this third fear, the fear of losing momentum. I remember when I took my proposal to Sundar, I was actually afraid he was gonna say yes. Because if he said yes, then I was probably gonna do it. And that in and of itself was a really hard step to take. I had worked my entire career to get to the point I was about to walk away from. It's like passing all the pre-qualifying rounds to the Olympics, only to get to the final competition and be like, I don't really feel like throwing javelins anymore. Like, here I was on this very well-defined track from MIT to PM to VP to bigger teams and whatever lay ahead, and I was gonna take a turn and instead start over and follow a passion that I didn't know if it was gonna lead anywhere. I still don't. And it wasn't that there was just this big unknown looming in front of me. I mean, we just talked about how that might actually be a good thing. It was that my identity had become defined by this career track I was on and where it was leading. And I had found comfort in the security and the prestige and the external validation that came from being successful on it. And that was, and sometimes still is, hard to walk away from. When I look back, I realize there are at least two things at play. The first is a known phenomenon called loss aversion. It dates back to experiments done by Daniel Kahneman and Amos Tversky in the 80s that show that people feel losses twice as strongly as they feel gains. And that leads to really interesting behaviors, including our tendency to value things once we have them, much more than we value those exact same things before they're ours. And that applies to pens and mugs, like they show in their experiments, but likely also things that we consider a bit closer to our sense of self. The way that I was able to break through that loss aversion was to ask myself, what am I optimizing for? And I find that to be a really important question to ask whenever I'm making a big decision or a big trade-off because knowing and being explicit and actually committing to myself what's, what's most important 
can be grounding and clarifying and actually something to fall back on when times get really tough. In this case, I decided I wanted to optimize for even the slightest chance of making an impact in education. And that immunized me from the loss aversion I would have felt otherwise. The second thing at play was comfort, pure and simple. The track that I was on, it was comfortable and it's seductive. It's well known and it's accepted and nobody questions the decision to stay on it. It took some reflection and apparently a few sleepless months to realize that I didn't necessarily want to go to the places that track was taking me. That based on what I was optimizing for, I needed to forge a new track somewhere else. Now, I don't know where this path will lead me or whether there's a happy ending to the story because I'm still in the middle of it, but I do know that no matter where that track goes, I will learn a ton and the journey will have been worth it. Now, the three fears I talked about today, the fear of rejection, the fear of feeling underqualified, the fear of losing momentum, they're by no means comprehensive of the fears that exist or even the ones that I've faced. But they are ones that I have found threatened to hold me back at key points in my career. And so I've learned to put them in check as I became aware of them. If you think about the things that hold you back or what keeps you from saying yes, you might have a similar or a different list you might have different strategies for working through them. For me, I found some fear I was able to overcome. Others are kind of like bad roommates that you just learn to live with as long as they stay in their room. And others I've actually learned to embrace. They're like, like some, of, some fear is positive and it's like a beacon telling me that that thing that seemed really scary in front of me is actually something I should be running towards, not away from. And I don't know what fear will make itself known next uh, or what will come my way as I work on this path, but I do know that no matter what it is, I will be willing to confront it. Thank you.